Welcome to Bed Crime Stories Podcast. I'm your host, T, and I hope you're having a great day. Hey, do me a favor before we get started. Subscribe to my channel if you're not yet subscribed, and do me a favor, hit that like button. It can really help. The Debbie Collier case is keeping me up at night. It's so bizarre, and it's so upsetting. Here we have this lovely 59-year-old lady, Debbie Collier, who by all appearances worked hard, took pride in herself, dressed impeccably, loved her children as witnessed by posts she made from time to time on her Facebook. She was all about family and not one to self-promote or do the look at me type of Facebook posts we see all too often. Who would want to harm, humiliate, and inflict the ultimate pain on this sweet lady? Who had motive? Who had the personality traits to plan and do such a thing? Is it possible two people had the same motive and personality traits? What are the odds? Today, I want to share my further refined theory about how this whole thing may have gone down. Before I do that, let me share some things Debbie's daughter's boyfriend, Andrew Geigerich, has shared with me via comments on my channel. First off, he said he is working. I'm not sure if that is with Williams Sonoma still or another company, but he is working. When I wrote the following question in response to a subscriber's comment, I wonder what his childhood was like, Andrew showed up and replied, Trust me, you don't want to know about that. He then explained a little about his past. He said that his dad has his issues, but he's been living a good life recently. Andrew also explained that he did not grow up with his bio dad. He did have a stepfather, however, and he said, and I quote, my stepdad, he was a real piece of work. Abusive would be an extreme understatement for him, end quote. That reminds me of what Summer Wells' father, Don Wells, said about his stepfather, which was later confirmed by his siblings. He, too, had a highly abusive stepfather. One thing is clear. Andrew loves his mother deeply. And when she was arrested for drug trafficking, when caught in an undercover sting operation in which she was attempting to sell methamphetamine with two other associates and then was subsequently sent to prison for a whopping 30 years. Yes, you heard that right. 30 years for her first felony charge. Andrew had to have been devastated. According to what I read, she will not be eligible for parole until 2036. Andrew told me that his mother's main concern when she was taken into custody was that someone watch over her kids while she's away in prison. That says something about her. And we've seen photos of Andrew's mother. There's one where she's standing next to her son after an MMA match. She's positively beaming in the photo, and we can see that she's a beautiful woman. Her mugshot, however, shows a very different face and conveys a very different emotion. Her feelings about the arrest pour off the page of that mugshot photo, and she doesn't even look like the same person. You can see the regret and the shame and the devastation in her face. According to Andrew, his mother was addicted to drugs when she got involved in the trafficking incident. If you don't know about that, check out the video I made about Andrew losing his mother. I agree with Andrew that an addiction can drive a person who has never committed a felony to do something crazy to get more of the drug. I too have a relative who got addicted. The drug that got its claws into my relative was heroin. 
and the cravings for more heroin when he ran out of money and things to pawn led him into very serious trouble. We have to remember that addiction is a disease and often it's caused by deep pain, emotional or physical. So let's not be judgy. There by the grace of God go I. I have the addiction gene too. My addictions aren't as dangerous though. I do things like get completely obsessed with true crime cases and I slam down a ton of chocolate and then have major regrets. So mine are less maybe damaging to my life, right? Although the chocolate can be a problem. Andrew said this about his mother. My mom has always tried to do her best. It's sad that this was her first felony offense and they sentenced her like a repeat offender. She wasn't a drug dealer. She just had an addiction and she made poor decisions while she was using. It did sting a little when she went away. It was sad. She told my dad to make sure he looked out for her kids while she was away. So even in her mistakes, she always tried to be a good mom, end quote. That's a very articulate description, don't you think? Andrew comes across as a very insightful person to me and quite articulate. Andrew shared that his mother was his primary parent and boy does he love her. It had to be shattering to him when she was charged with trafficking methamphetamine and sentenced to those 30 years. From what Andrew said, this was her first felony offense. It sounds like she maybe had a court-appointed lawyer who didn't do much for her. Andrew said that this occurred in Barrow County, and he insinuated that this county may be notorious for bad cops. He also claimed he'd been assaulted by a police officer out there. I don't know if there's any truth to that, and I really don't know about Barrow County's reputation. If anyone out there does, please leave me a note in the comments. Andrew also stated that he hopes his mother gets released in maybe five years, which would be 2027. However, from what I read in an article about the incident, it said that her first possible release date is in 2036. Clearly, Andrew's mother means the world to him. Andrew also talked briefly about his amateur MMA career, which he abruptly stopped in 2018. When I asked him why he stopped competing, he wrote this, I had so much going on in day-to-day -day life. It felt like I was exhausted before my last fight. So I took some time off to relax and get my life together. And I'm still working on that today, as you can see. I'm still young as far as an MMA career goes, so I definitely can make a comeback. That's my goal. Maybe get a fight in six months, probably pro, while I still have a chance. I just want to make my mom proud, one way or the other. She was always bragging to her friends about my MMA career. I'm not sure, but I think after five years, she might be eligible for parole. Hopefully, I can have a lot of money by then because I don't want her to ever have to work again, end quote. Note that in Andrew's comments, he sometimes writes sentences all in lowercase letters and leaves out the punctuation, just an observation. You can see his comments on my community page today. On to my theory. As I've been trying to reconcile the Family Dollar Store video, wherein Debbie Collier looks perfectly calm and she doesn't make any kind of distress signal, doesn't alert the cashier with that weird Venmo payment for $2,385 along with the cryptic note to her daughter, Amanda. I've come up with a theory that I think may explain things. Now, this is just a theory and I'm simply speculating. That's what we do in true crime. I don't know who hurt Debbie Collier and no one has been charged or convicted in her case. So this is all allegedly. This is pure speculation. It's just my opinion. 
and it's really for entertainment purposes, although that sounds terrible, because true crime is not really entertainment. It's sad and tragic, and yet we have this interest in it. But I digress. Let's dig in. The black rented Chrysler Pacifica that Debbie Collier was driving the day she visited the family dollar store had tinted back windows. If someone or someones, as in plural, were in the vehicle with her that day, perhaps in the back seat or the back cargo area, those tinted windows would have masked their presence. I have to believe someone was inside the vehicle because of the Venmo payment to Amanda, which was made at 3.17 p.m. when Debbie Collier pulled the SUV into a different parking spot and sat for approximately two minutes. What if two people were in that vehicle with Debbie? And what if one of them had a weapon to the other's head? And the two of them were pretending that perpetrator one was going to hurt perpetrator two if Debbie did not comply with their orders to go into the dollar store and buy those specific items. Let's also say perpetrator two was someone Debbie loved very much, someone she would not want to see hurt, especially with a weapon. Perpetrator one could have said to Debbie something like, if you do anything to alert the cashier or anyone else, I will use this weapon on so-and-so, as in, I will do perpetrator two in. If Debbie believed that the perpetrator was serious about harming her loved one and she bought into the two people's act, she would likely have done anything to prevent that. I'm pretty sure the one thing Debbie treasured more than anything else was her family, her husband, her children, her grandchildren, her dog, etc. We also know that in May of 2021, Debbie's daughter, Amanda Bearden, gave the police a note in which her boyfriend, Andrew Geigerich, threatened Amanda and her family. The note was scrawled in green magic marker, and it said that if Amanda or her family ever came near him again, he would hurt them. Because of that note, Debbie Collier would have totally bought into a scenario where someone was seriously threatening her loved one. And we know that Amanda was likely fighting with her mother on Friday night when the neighbor heard arguing coming from the Collier home and one of the voices was described as that of a young woman. If that was Amanda fighting with either Debbie or her stepfather Steve or both, maybe whatever caused that fight made Amanda so angry at her mom that she told her boyfriend, I've had it. She needs to go and we're gonna get the money you need. I know that's tough to swallow for most of us, but children sometimes harm their parents, especially if they're dealing with a drug addiction or mental illness or both. I'm not saying that either one of these people suffer from either of those afflictions, nor am I accusing them. I'm just trying to come up with a plausible theory here based on what we know. I mean, the police did obtain a search warrant for Amanda Bearden's home a mere three days after Debbie Collier was discovered in that ravine. That tells me they had a strong suspicion that Amanda may be involved. By the way, I don't think Andrew and Amanda have any addiction issues, at least currently. I think the problems that they have are more rooted in anger management issues. At least that's what I'm seeing from their arrest records. We also know that an unused bullet cartridge was found near where Debbie's vehicle was discovered parked on Sunday, September 11th. If that bullet is related to this crime, and I think it is because it is said not to be the type of bullet hunters use, then that means a gun or rifle was involved. It doesn't mean that the weapon was used to harm Debbie, but it could have been used to threaten her into complying with whatever she was ordered to do. And Debbie probably would not ever imagine that a family member would be willing to play act like this and then commit the ultimate betrayal. Debbie likely would have bought this act hook, line, and sinker. 
she's programmed to see potential perpetrator one as someone who's capable of hurting others. Amanda accused her boyfriend, Andrew, of causing those bruises we see in the photo of Amanda's shoulder, right? And we've learned that he was an amateur MMA fighter. MMA fighters know how to use their bodies to control others. They use chokeholds, if I'm not mistaken. If you don't know what MMA is, let me briefly explain it. I really didn't know either. Mixed martial arts is sometimes referred to as cage fighting. It's no holds barred, and it's been described as the ultimate fighting and a full contact combat sport that allows a wide variety of fighting techniques and skills. The rules allow the use of both striking and grappling techniques while standing and on the ground. MMA fighters use various moves to get their opponents completely in their control. They can fight with their fists, they can jab, they can use double leg takedown. They can also employ something called a rear naked choke. A rear naked choke is a chokehold that is applied from an opponent's back. The fighter uses his arms. Such a move is considered a blood choke because it restricts blood flow to the brain via the carotid arteries. When applied correctly, it can cause temporary unconsciousness in a few seconds. Scary stuff. I don't think you'd want to encounter an angry MMA fighter with bad intentions on a dark, deserted street, if you know what I mean. Back to my theory. I think that it's possible that Debbie was taken when she was at her home that morning. I say that because she was wearing that bizarre and very loud game day outfit. Debbie Collier, in all her other photos, wears lovely, coordinated outfits. She clearly knows what colors look good with other colors. On the day she shopped at the dollar store, Debbie was wearing a maroon t-shirt, black shoes, and a blue purse. Not a harmonious look. She also had on a red visor. I think this crazy getup was deliberate. The perpetrator or perpetrators wanted Debbie to stand out like a sore thumb on that security video so that the police would later see that Debbie bought these items herself, which were later used in the crime. The tarp, the torch lighter, the paper towels. Brilliant move on the part of the perpetrator, right? Get the victim to buy the items for the crime. The visor is the only thing that throws me off. Could whoever planned this crime have wanted to throw in an element of uncertainty? As in, is that really Debbie Collier in that store? I think so. The body looks like Debbie's, but we can't see her face. And guess what? If that was the perpetrator's aim, it worked. A lot of people have been speculating that they think it's not Debbie in the family dollar store surveillance footage, but rather her daughter Amanda. Some have even suggested it could be her daughter's boyfriend in a wig. I find this speculation a tad ridiculous. Note that the police have stated all along that it was Debbie Collier who shopped there that day, and the clerk positively identified the lady she waited on that day as Debbie Collier, not Amanda Bearden. Also, the body shapes between these three people are very different and very distinct. So, I think we can finally lay that one to rest. Debbie Collier drove in a very strange way in the Family Dollar Store parking lot. She didn't just back up and drive away. She sat for like seven minutes and then slowly backed up and drove to another parking space not far away. She sat in that spot for two more minutes, just enough time to send a Venmo payment and a carefully worded note to her daughter, Amanda. I think that Debbie was forced to make that Venmo payment and to write those exact words, or she was forced to share her password so that someone else could make that happen off her phone. 
someone was trying hard to convince the police, who would undoubtedly later be investigating the crime, that Debbie wrote the note because he or she made sure to include that last bit about leaving the key in the blue flower pot. Only Debbie Collier would know she had a blue flower pot, right? Or at least that's what the police are supposed to think. Now, I'm also thinking that another possibility would be that this whole ruse started back at the Collier home when Debbie woke up or maybe was awakened. Perhaps the perpetrators went there and maybe this is when perpetrator one first started pretending that he was going to hurt perpetrator two with that weapon and perpetrator two started pretending that she was really terrified of perpetrator one maybe it was potential perpetrator one who told debbie what to wear that day and that's why the outfit was so loud maybe then perp one forced debbie to get into the chrysler pacifica with perp two and then Perp 1 got into a different vehicle. In this scenario, the perps would have had a vehicle to leave the crime scene with. Perhaps that car drove to the Tallulah Falls spot from a different direction, or maybe it drove behind Debbie's vehicle or before Debbie's vehicle. We know that two other vehicles in the Family Dollar Store parking lot seem to drive in weird directions and even leave close to the time Debbie drove out. That would have forced Perp 2 to keep play acting, but without Perp 1 there while in the car with Debbie. But again, I think it's likely potential perpetrator 2 was angry with Debbie that day about something. So they get the items purchased, they force Debbie to send the Venmo and the note, and then they tell her to drive to that national forest area. Maybe when they get to the woods, that's where the ruse is exposed, and Debbie finds out that she's been betrayed by perpetrator two, and that this whole thing is really serious, really messed up, and she's maybe dealing with perpetrators who have much worse mental health issues than she realized. I mean, who could fathom what was to come. It's so horrible. People with feelings and heart cannot even imagine this type of thing. They couldn't even come up with such a plot. Then maybe potential perpetrator two drives off in the vehicle perpetrator one came in to go to Alta and a few other businesses where their face can be picked up on surveillance cameras for an alibi and perpetrator one remains at the wooded area and perpetrator one is the person who forces Debbie down the embankment where perp one commits the final deed. Of course that won't help perp one establish an alibi for that period unless perpetrator two is willing to lie about it but it will help perpetrator two prove that they were elsewhere during the worst part of the crime. Again, this is just me speculating. The manner in which Debbie was found hints, at least to me, of a male perpetrator, forcing her to remove articles of clothing. That's usually the act of a male perpetrator, in my opinion. And if we find out Debbie was essayed there through DNA evidence, well, there you go. But of course, it could also be that a female would want to humiliate another female, especially if anger and rage were fueling the crime, which I think they were. Whenever the perp or perps decided the crime was done, they tried to burn the scene up, burn up the evidence. They started the fire, thought all was good, and they needed to get away before that fire really took off and then they departed in the other vehicle. Now, retired detective Bill Cannon of Police Off the Cuff said something that was also intriguing yesterday, and Mike King, another retired detective of Profiling Evil, said it too in a show he did with Court TV. 
They both said that they thought it was possible that Debbie Collier was done in before she got to the wooded area, as in perhaps harmed inside the SUV or somewhere else and then transported or moved to the spot in the ravine. That is a very interesting idea. Could that blue tarp have been used to pull her down to the ravine? Carrying a body is hard as heck. Even if the person isn't all that heavy, it's just pure dead weight. And that was definitely not an intended pun. And those paper towels could have been used as kindling to try and start the fire to burn up the evidence. Maybe start a forest fire in the process and really char everything in sight for acres. And then again, maybe only one person did this crime. But then how would that person make his or her getaway from the crime scene? What do you guys think? Am I all wet? Or does this make sense and offer a plausible reason why Debbie Collier acted so cool and calm in the store and she didn't ask for help? And maybe that pause she takes at the door when entering the store is a thought like, should I ask for help? And then she looks back and says, no. Please let me know in the comments. Hey, if you enjoyed this video and the work I'm putting in here at Bed Crime Stories, please smash that like button, leave me a comment, and subscribe to my channel. It is all so much appreciated. Until the next time on Bed Crime Stories.